This is the Lock Picking Lawyer, and what I have for you today is a multi-lock interactive Japanese format cylinder. This lock was sent to me by Urban Hawk along with a few other Japanese locks. Hopefully you'll be seeing more of them in the future, however, I do have my work cut out for me because this multi-lock is probably the easiest of the group. Now if you look carefully at this lock, you can see some pitting in the surface, and that usually means this lock has been outside for a while. That can make locks a lot harder to pick because they accumulate a lot of dirt and grime inside. However, this particular cylinder works remarkably smoothly considering that it's been outside in the past. Now the Japanese format of this lock can tell us a few things about what's inside that may help us in our picking. If we compare it to this American multi-lock, you can see a few differences right off the bat. First, this multi-lock is a little bit smaller in diameter, about five millimeters less, but the important thing to notice is the placement of the core. In the Japanese lock, it's right in the center of the cylinder, and on the American lock, it's down at the bottom. What this means is we don't have a lot of room for driver pins in this Japanese lock, so what, what we'll probably find inside is an abbreviated version of multi-lock's normal pins, probably something similar to what they would put in a cam lock or a furniture lock. So let's see what it takes to pick into this lock. We're going to be using this long Z-bar for tension, and I usually use tension tools with long ends on them when I'm picking dimple locks, so I can use them to guide my pick like this. What that means is I don't have to worry about the pick sliding from side to side, I only have to worry about depth control. That's particularly important on a lock like this with a pin-in-pin -pin format because it requires a lot more precision when picking the pins. So let's start picking. I am looking for binding outer pins and I got one on number one. Nothing on two. Number three is binding. Click there. Number four, got to click out of the outer pin there and five, binding tightly, and I clicked on that, and we got a little bit of movement on the core. Back to the beginning, nothing on the outer or inner pin. Okay, on number two, okay, counter rotation on the outer pin on two, and we got a deeper false set now. Got a little click on the inner pin on three, nothing on four, or five, back to the beginning. Okay, an inner driver pin on slot one, and we got it open. Okay, let's see what it takes to, uh, to get this guy apart. Now, interestingly, this little bezel or spinner that you see around the cylinder can't be removed after it's been installed once. What they do is they pin this little cover plate on the cylinder from the side, actually from both sides, and you can't remove this spinner without removing those pins, so we're stuck with it on here. However, it does look like we can disassemble this with a Phillips screwdriver. Okay. Looks like we should just need a key and the follower, and hopefully this will come apart without too much drama. Okay, got all our pins there. I see a master wafer in here. Let's check the side. We've got a couple of passive pins and a ball bearing for drill resistance. Let's see if we can get everything from the side out first. We lost our ball bearing. Okay, now we can start getting the other pins out. Okay, nothing unusual thus far in slot one or in slot two, all standards the master wafer in slot three, nothing special on four or five. 
Okay, let me arrange all these pins. Okay, let's get these driver pins out now. Okay, as anticipated, we do have a small version of the driver pin in there. Looks like the same one that you would find in their furniture locks. That one has a spooled inner pin and a standard outer. On number two, we have a mushroom outer pin and a spooled inner pin. Okay, on number three, standard outer and spooled inner pin. Okay, on number four, mushroom outer and spooled inner. And yep, I thought I saw a master wafer in there. And number five, standard outer and spooled inner. Okay, just a side note here. The, the pinning here is somewhat unusual, though less so now that I see that there are master wafers, so this was certainly pinned up by a locksmith. It's very rare that you will see any sort of security pin in the number two slot in a multi-lock interactive. Almost always what you'll find is spooled outer pins everywhere but the number two spot. However, now that I see it was pinned up by a locksmith after the fact, it's making a little bit more sense. Okay, let me give you a close up of all of this. Okay, on the key pins, everything looks pretty standard. All of the outer pins are standard, as are the inner. Then on the driver pins, it looks like we have all spooled inner pins and standard outers with the exception of the mushroomed outer pins in slots two and four. And of course we have those two master wafers in slots three and four. Over in slot eight, you can see we have two passive pins for key control and a ball bearing that was placed right up front in this hole. I'm assuming that's for drill resistance so someone doesn't drill right down the right side of that core and cut the core in half. As far as drill resistance goes, looks like we have hardened pins above and below the keyway, and also a ball bearing in front of the pin stack. Nothing else particularly unusual about this. If you look down slot two, you can see the detent that operates the interactive element on the key. Okay, so that's all I have for you on this multi-lock interactive Japanese format cylinder. Urban Hawk, thank you very much for sending this my way, and hopefully we'll be seeing some other of those Japanese locks soon. To everyone else, if you do have any questions or comments about this, please put them below. If you like this video and would like to see more like it, please subscribe. And as always, have a nice day. Thank you.